Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon in Romania and uh, good morning in, in New York. Richard, Richard Peña is, uh, uh, is uh, the, the guest I have for this Salon uh, Insula 42. Uh, and I'm really happy to see, to see Richard this Saturday. And I hope that all of you who joined us live um, are curious to find out um, what, uh, what Richard has to say about this 15th edition of Making Waves. But uh, before starting uh, to ask questions to Richard, who is professor at Columbia University of Film Studies, but who for a very long time was the director of Film Society of Lincoln Center and also the director of the New York Film Festival, and he was a very active um, uh, curator and, and programmer for many, many other um, endeavors and, and initiatives and uh, uh, events in Europe and in the United States. He's a very, very fond uh, admirer of uh, Eastern European cinema. So he doesn't only love Romanian cinema, but, but always was very fond of Eastern European cinema. I will never forget um, uh, Richard. Before we start, you have this library behind you, this, this image of the library behind you. But when I went to your office first uh, in New York, I will never forget, it was still packed with <laughs> documents, books, uh, scripts. And uh, I had this kind of, um, uh, I don't know, um, I had this kind of image of someone who reads, and sees films and loves it, which, uh, which is great. Richard, we, we are um, in the third day of Making Waves, uh, the Romanian Film Festival in New York. Uh, even Juan Aradu, Mihai Kirilov and myself were well, still amazed by this longevity. Yeah. But because your story with Romanian film comes from very, very long in the past, I will first okay. ask you, how did this story start? How did you first, what were the first films, Romanian films you saw, and how did this story start? Because it starts before the fall of communism. Yep. Uh, thank you, it's always a pleasure to be in touch with you, Karina and Juana, and of course, to do anything I can to help promote Romanian cinema. Uh, it really did begin for me back in the 1980s. Um, I happened to be in Washington, D.C. when the American Film Institute was showing some kind of package, a film by Don Pizza called Orienteering. And, uh, you know, I was very impressed by the film. And then I requested that the film be shown in Chicago. I was working at the time at the Art Institute of Chicago as its film programmer. And so I showed it. And then just serendipitously, uh, a few weeks after that, uh, a man came from Romania, uh, a man who was an animator, essentially, but, you know, was traveling. Back then when the U.S. used to have these visiting filmmakers traveling around the United States and things like that. And he was very impressed by the fact that while he was there, we were doing a Portuguese film series. And he said, I, I had no idea that, you know, Americans were open to such things. So I said, well, you know, I am or, I, you know, whatever. And then he said, do you know anything about Romanian cinema? And I just told him that I had just seen Orienteering and that I uh, admired it and things like that. So he said, well, would you like to come to Romania? Maybe you could organize a Romanian film series. And I said, gee, that sounds wonderful. So anyway, the next year, we're into 1984, after the Cannes Film Festival, I went to Romania and spent about eight, nine days just really watching as many films as I could at Romania Film and also getting to know Dan Pizza and Mircea Veroyo and Mircea Danieliuk and Alexander Tatos. You know, we were all incredibly warm um, and very, very uh, open to me. This was an odd moment because I'm sure you recall, in 1980, Romania had refused to participate in the Moscow Olympics. So suddenly Romania and Ceausescu were somehow very favored in the eye of the U.S. So in fact, I can remember I was invited to the U.S. Embassy and told that this was a wonderful thing that I was doing and they would support it any way they could and all that because they wanted to continue this good relationship with the Ceausescu regime. Anyway, to make a long story short, about a year later, took a while, of course, to get 
the funds to subtitle the films and all that. We presented what was, must have been one of the first Romanian film weeks in New York City. That really was composed of work from the late 70s till about 1984, when, as you know, there was a real interesting opening, at least for a few years, in Romanian cinema, partially perhaps as a result of this, when this, at that point, young generation of people like Dan Pizza and the others you know, we're really making works that were beginning to challenge a lot of ideas about, you know, communist orthodoxy or whatever, or just presenting films that in their way were challenging. And I was very interested in them. As you mentioned, I already had some knowledge of Polish cinema, uh, Hungarian cinema, Czech, you know, a couple of other East European cinemas, but really Romanian cinema was a cipher. And I guess in terms of my work as a film programmer and as a film historian, I've always hated black holes. When there seems to be some black hole of knowledge in film history, I want to know what went on there. So anyway, this became a real interest for me to learn what I could about Romanian cinema. And uh, I, again, now soon after that, things began to get very strict again. I remember Don Pizza made a film called Sand Cliffs, yeah. which really ran afoul of the regime. And that I, I think the legend was that Ceausescu saw it and went crazy and said, get this out of the screens and whatever. And after that, things became you know, more strict again. But I think the, the fuse had been lit and people had some awareness of Romania. And then after the fall of Ceausescu, people were, I think, waiting you know, to see when Romania would you know, begin to start producing works that many of us wanted to see. We also had somewhat around that time the return of Lucian Pintelea, yes. who of course had made enormously important films in the 1960s, uh, Sunday at Six, uh, 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 what you call it? Uh, 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 Reconstruction. Uh, Reconstruction. I'm sorry. <laughs> Reconstruction, and of course was well known as a theater director. And he made The Oak, which we showed in the 1992 New York Film Festival, I think. And again, so it was a bit step by step, people were looking, but you know, it sometimes happens, you know, a little bit, you know, I can compare it a little bit to the situation in Spain. When Franco died, everyone thought, ah, finally Spanish cinema is free. But in fact, it was curious, a lot of the filmmakers had almost gotten used to making these very, almost clandestine films with a lot of kind of very, almost Kabbalistic imagery and sort of very complicated plots. And the new generation was not that turned on by that. They had to wait for Almodovar, who was the opposite, who was the, you know, complete openness in a certain way. You know, as Almodovar said, I make films as if Franco never existed, you know. And in a way, I think that happened a little bit in Romania, perhaps took a little bit longer in that that generation, that Oyo and uh, Daniel Iuk and others continue to make good films, but somehow I think they had lost a kind of connection, especially with a new generation. And that new generation, in a certain way, needed the emergence of what we now call the Romanian new wave with, but, or, you know, Christy Puyu. Yeah. But, 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 but Richard, please, we, I want to stop a little bit in, in just concluding a bit this part of the older generation, because you, you speak about pizza and orienteering is concours which was a mm -hmm. film also, no, I'm just translating for those who just yes, uh, course, look yes. and maybe don't recognize the, the title. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the, the fact is that one was a very, con I mean, a very controversial film. It, it, yes. was, it was a very strong film. And at that time, already uh, this generation of Pizza Daneluk, they, they, were, um, they were also bringing something to the screen that unfortunately could not travel as much as it it would have been good for 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 films to to travel but uh, also putting in a, a parallel 
Lucian Pintilier's film. What, what was the first film you saw by Pintilier? It was... Um, it actually Sunday was the Oak. I had not seen either Sunday at Six nor Reconstruction. No, Reconstruction. Fire I knew of them because by then I had read what I could about Romanian cinema, but I had never seen them. It was really the Oak. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it, I remember when he came, he came to New York for the screening of it. I said to him, how can I see your early films? And he said, when you come to Paris, I'll try and arrange for you to see them because he had copies yeah. there. But but the, my question is, how 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 much do you see this uh, uh, new generation of filmmakers in relation to uh, Pizza Daneliuk or in relation to Pintilie? Which one do you think were, was more influential in a way uh, to the way that the, the Romanian new wave is uh, is is creating and created? You know, I think each generation responded to the situation they found. People in the late 70s, early 80s, in no way could make a film like The Death of Mr. Lazarescu. It would have been impossible, you know? So they had to proceed cautiously, again, often symbolically, um, sometimes a little bit allegorically. So all of these films, I think they continue to have their critique and, and many things to say about Romania, but they had to do it in a certain way or else you know, as we saw with sand cliffs, it would be all over. So this generation, again, a little bit like Almodovar, could lay it all out, could say what they wanted. And in fact, I, I think I mentioned in one of my introductions, uh, among the things I admire about Romanian cinema is this ability to present a bad situation and then just show you it getting it worse. You know, <laughs> that not sort of, you know, it, it's a kind of wonderful sort of, approach where, gee, this is bad. And by the end, you're like, wow, this is horrible, you know? You know, they really, and there's no, they don't pull punches. They don't make it better for you or make it sort of a little lighter. No, on the opposite, on the contrary. And this was, you know, something I really admired about the works, that they were really hard-headed, really um, straight shooting in a certain way, and just continued in that direction. Uh, sadly, as I think we both know, there was sometimes, I think, less comprehension between the generations. Uh, I think the older people sometimes felt a little cheated that they hadn't gotten the kind of international yeah. glory and things like that, yeah. that, you know, Munju or Puyu or Muntea or the others had gotten. And on the other hand, I think the younger generation didn't appreciate perhaps what these older generation, what they had lived through you know, and what the limitations on their work was. But, you know, again, cinema has a certain edible history. You know, I think one generation is always trying to kill the fathers and trying to say, oh, I had nothing to do with them or whatever. I think when we look, you know, with a longer view, we can say, of course, there were connections and things like that. Just as in a certain way, the generation of the late 70s, early 80s was linked to the generation of the early 60s. I mean, in a way, you know, you look first with Poland, then I'd say Czechoslovakia, then Hungary. That was the moment that all these East European cinemas really began to emerge as international forces. And I think Romania was set to do that with Pintalea, with uh, Trule, with, you know, a few other directors who began to emerge at that point. But 1964 happened and that was it. Nobody that wanted to it. hear about absolutely, it. Absolutely, absolutely. And and now, if if your first film from that period was Pita's uh, orienteering, what was the first film that you saw uh, of the Romanian new wave, uh, Richard? It depends. You know, new waves are one of those things. When does it begin? Does it begin yeah, with okay. actual tango? Does it begin with? I mean, there are a lot of different anticipations yeah. of it. I think for a lot of people, you know, the the film that really burst like a, a cannonball was The Death of Mr. Lazarescu, because right. it was so good and so powerful. And, you know, just really, I think people said, gee, we had no idea Romania was making, you know, films of this level. I could at least say, well, I knew that. I mean, because I had seen a lot of the older films. But for a lot of people, it was a complete surprise. I mean, Romanian cinema, I'm sorry to say, hardly existed. And even something like Pintalea was seen as an exile. You know, he made yeah. this film because he didn't live in Romania, you know. Right. So so you you saw and, and then you saw also Munjiu and then you also saw uh, Porumboyu. And what was what is what is uh, uh, Richard your take? 
precisely because you knew also both the context and also the the creations, the the, the films of Daneliuk and Veroyu and Tatos. What was you, what what do you think was really uh, identifying this group of directors? Puyu Munju, even though they are very different, and as you very well know, they also prefer to prefer to say we are not a new wave. We are each yes. authors with right. one own uh, individuality, which is which is true. But what do you think really also brings in common their aesthetics? You know, I I, I think. There are two things. First, I think there's an extraordinary physicality to their work. Um, you know, again, I think some of that has to do with if that earlier generation that I mentioned was by force of circumstance um, required to hide a lot of their points and their criticisms and their views behind allegories and things like that. You think of a film like Tatoshi's Sequences, you know, which is a marvelous film, but I mean, it requires quite a sophisticated reading, I think, to try and get, you know, all that's going on. This generation, again, could put it all out there, you know, and in a way, when, you know, when they can make a film like Lazarescu or 432 or things like that, these were films that really stared you, you know, almost dared you to look at them. Because as I said, things just kept on getting worse and worse, and it was really a challenge. I'll add to that that Romanian cinema, this so-called new wave, emerged at a time when internationally there was a kind of growing, what you might call long take aesthetic. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of this became possible or more possible because of digital filmmaking. You know, 35 millimeter at its best gave you a 10 minute shot. Whereas now with digital files, as we saw, you could have a film that lasted 90 minutes with one shot, you know? They didn't necessarily go that far, but they could film the length they wanted. And it was more than just a kind of fetish. You know, again, if you look at a film like, <laughs> excuse me, 432, the long shots are there. They're pushed to the point of almost being unbearable. And that's what I think Munju wants to do. He wants to make the film incredibly uncomfortable for the viewer. So you think of that great sequence when, I forget the name of the actor, Ank is at the house of her boyfriend. And there's that incredible, very slow track in as she's sitting there. And these people are just talking nonsense to each other about, you know, little gossips and little criticisms and whatever. And she's realizing she wants to get back to see her friend who's just had this abortion. And the shot's almost unbearable. You know, you can't, you know, when it finally ends, you go, thank God, you're so happy yeah. to be out of that situation. And I think that in a way, what was great is they gave the long take a kind of... Um, how could you say, greater meaning than just a kind of technical wizardry, you know? Oh, how great, that shot lasted for nine minutes. Well, what did, it do, what did you do with it, you know? What yeah. came out of it? You know, not to uh, be nasty, but take that recent film, was it 1917 or 1918, that yeah. one that came out about war? Yeah. I mean, these incredibly long shots, but why? Yeah. We, what do we get out of it? Nothing. Yeah. We follow people for 20 minutes. Who cares? You know, I mean, that really annoyed me because it just being like a technical exercise and, you know, very few times that I think it was used effectively. Whereas, again, I feel the long take, which is kind of a format I've always been partial to, was used so effectively by these directors and many others. Um, was it the was it Tuesday afternoon, Tuesday morning? I'm Tuesday, forgetting the title. No, Tuesday after Christmas by Radu Montan. Tuesday after Christmas. I mean, you know, that yeah. film is another one where Radu the shots Montan, are yeah. literally unbearable. I mean, you cannot watch anymore. You know, and I think that that's been something that these filmmakers have been willing to play with. Perhaps, especially at a time when we're so inundated with visual culture. I mean, how many times a day do we see moving images? You know, or are we filmed through surveillance cameras, through, you know, whatever. And here finally are images that you can't look at. Um, who is it? Oh, uh, the art historian Michael Fried, talking in another context, says the ultimate realist image is the one you can't look, you can't bear to look at. You know, in a certain way, yeah. I think that that's, that's it's a, a good it's a, it's a very good, yeah, it's a very good uh, synthesis yeah. of this. Richard, when yeah. you did this retrospective, while um, uh, I was director of the Romanian Cultural Institute in New York, and we invited you to curate the retrospective, you again came to Bucharest, you chose films, you chose both older and newer films. What was your criteria in 
in doing this uh, this uh, choice how how did you what what did uh, what was the key to this programming yeah well i guess you know in my life as i've been both a film curator and a film historian i always hope one informs the other and this was an act of curatorship that i wanted to be informed by my knowledge as a film historian you know I, again i think so often we think Oh, you know, Chinese cinema begins with this. You no, know, Chinese cinema has been going on for a long time. They had a lot of really interesting films. You know, let's understand the roots of this. And as you know, I had a, a fondness and some personal relationships with people like Daniele Luca Pizza and a few yeah. others. So, in a sense, for me, it was really, um, I, you know, just an, an ideal to say, look, isn't contemporary Romanian cinema terrific? But you realize that there's a good tradition here, and it goes back decades. So let's bring those together. Now, remember, we, we did have that idea that, well, there's, you know, I, I at least discovered there's a little more, I don't call it hostility, but discomfort between the groups. And that's sad because that happens. I mean, I can cite many cases I know over the years, for example, older Chinese filmmakers who very much resented Zhang Yimou or Chen Kaiga, who suddenly became the lions of, you know, international cinema, when these people had made really excellent films, but never got an ounce of that kind of international recognition for all kinds of different reasons. So, you know, these are people, they're human beings, you know, these things happen. But at least I hope that the New York audience, and, you know, somewhat the national audience who saw this, would recognize that filmmaking did not begin in Romania with the death of Mr. Lazarus. Right, it right. And, that tradition, and there were really significant works that we can say are linked to the new wave, not linked, but it was there. So yeah. I, I, that's, for me, something that's important as a film historian, that we always un understand that there are traditions here. And that, 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 that there is a cinema school and that are, that are professionals and, and filmmakers who provided material for this new, uh, new generation of, of directors to uh, emerge. Because this is a question, you know, uh, Richard, that we all uh, get over and over again. And, probably you did also, okay, how did they appear? And indeed, the retrospective was an answer, an indirect answer to this. Now, I'm going to, to turn to the Making Waves Film Festival, <laughs> because as you, as you uh, we, we will always uh, um, uh, stay with this very strong uh, um, gratefulness in what you're concerned, Richard, because you came and invited us to Lincoln Center, and you said, okay, so the festival is strong enough, it, it deserves to come to Lincoln Center and address an even broader audience that we could address when we were, were at uh, Tribeca Cinemas. My question to, to, to you regarding the, the festival, uh, uh, Richard, is uh, please tell the, the people who listen, why do you think it is so important to curate even a national film festival? Because we were talking today about the authors, how you take films, why you take, how you select them. And Mihai Kirilov is curating this festival for us since the, the beginning. And he is an artistic dire director of, of the festival and the artistic director of TIFF. But uh, uh, a lot of times I'm, I was getting this question, why do we need an artistic uh, director? Because, uh, because basically um, having a film festival means just taking some films. And this is very much, unfortunately, still the idea of the diplomatic um, um, community who thinks that cultural diplomacy is just about taking some nice films and putting them in front of a foreign audience. So making waves, how do you see it from this point of view? Yeah. Let me just go back a second and say, you know, I would have been really delighted to have started making waves from its very first season at Lincoln Center. You know, we always had a problem in that at that point, we only had one cinema. And as you know, we already had a number of fixed series, the New York Jewish Film Festival, yeah. uh, Rendezvous with French Cinema. I mean, and in a way, I think there was always on the part of the staff, uh, a kind of healthy concern that we didn't want to block out the entire year with expected programs. So, but I would have been pleased from the very beginning to have done it. It was just, we had to wait for a moment when we felt, okay, now we can do it, but be that as it may. In a way, obviously, I, as I mentioned, a good deal of my life, I worked as a film curator. And 
the, the simple truth is that there are far too many films made. And I think the audience is in no position to figure out necessarily what they would like to see or what they want to see. So a curator basically is there to say, look, of these 50 or 40 or 30 Romanian films that are made, here are the 10 or 12 that are most significant that I think you should watch for all kinds of reasons. Now, you can disagree with that choice, but at least the choice has been made. In, in a way, it was always a discussion I had working at the New York Film Festival where people felt the fact that we only showed 25 to 28 films was this terrible thing, that we were elitist, that we were, you know. And I used to say, look, I, I mean, between that and, say, the policy of something like Toronto or Montreal, where you show 300 plus films and the directors say, well, let the audience decide what they want to see. That seems to me irresponsible because I think it just overwhelms people. And there's no way people can make a choice. You're only going to have a hundred words to describe the film. Who knows? You know, so Netflix has that policy too. Netflix seems to, you know, refuse to curate programs. You know, they would never want to do here are five new, you know, whatever films. They don't believe that. Okay. But I think that's a disservice. You know, I think that in a way, uh, People need all the help they can. And, you know, you can disagree with the curator, but at least as long as there's a vision there, I think there's something to begin with. So, again, um, as time has gone on, I think that Michai has done a wonderful job, you know, generally getting the very best from Romanian cinema, and, and why not? But, again, I think, you know, art, as much as I would like it to be, isn't always democratic. You know, I wish every film was as good as every other, but they're not. So better to sort of play with your strongest films, you know, and then, you know, hopefully get more and more people interested in it. Now, there might be, for example, a year that someone who I would regard as a major director makes a less interesting film. Well, then the question becomes, do you show it because people already know this person's work and they're interested in seeing where this person is going? Or you just say, nope, not good enough. That's, you know, a curatorial yeah. decision. And I can argue both sides of it. Richard, we, we uh, as, as running the festival and having, because you know that the festival, luckily, you accepted to take it even when uh, the Romanian Cultural Institute no longer supported it and we had these crazy ideas and, and we owe to you also the fact that you said yes, if you still come with part of the money and uh, the three of you, then uh, we, will, uh, we will do it. Um, but again and again, we have this kind of um, discussion with the with the filmmakers and someone sometimes with the people in the Romanian industry regarding the need for such a festival in the United States. Now, during the pandemic, we were very happy that uh, we had a lot of positive <laughs> kind of feedback in terms of, oh, wow, even during pandemic, you can do it, even though you do it online virtually. Uh, but can you can you also uh, uh, discuss a little bit and tell uh, tell the people who listen to the salon, uh, why in fact, even though it doesn't give something immediately, the constancy of having a Romanian film festival of this envergure, of this kind of, uh, um, uh, let, let's say, uh, uh, importance and value, because it's not just a festival done by a university, it's a festival present in New York and present okay. in very important venues. Why is it important to have it each year and what kind of service uh, does this offer indirectly to Romanian filmmakers? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, sort of a, a long question. Let me try and answer different parts of it. I think it's important because obviously the more that American audiences see, the more they can understand about Romania and its cinema. They get used to certain actors, certain directors, certain themes, so it becomes more familiar to them. So each year, there's just a growing awareness of who people are and, and what they're doing and things like that. So I think that helps just to continue to build audiences. There is some you know, financial or commercial concern that by showing that these films can get an audience that hopefully they will attract distribution. But as you and I know, we're sadly living through a very difficult time for foreign film distribution. If I saw anything in my 25 years at the uh, Film Society of Lincoln Center, it's that that sector of the American mediascape practically imploded. I mean, you know, there was no longer many cinemas, people, I mean, I, I can't tell you, especially in the last five or 
maybe even 10 years of my time at the New York Film Festival, how often I heard from distributors who were bright, knowledgeable people that, God, I love that film, but I can't distribute it. It's just too risky. You know, somehow that really would break my heart because I would often know that these films that I presented in the festival and which got wonderful reactions from critics, from the audience, from every, they would just say, too difficult. I can't do it, you know? And I think if anything, that situation has gotten worse. So in a way, Romanian cinema had the bad luck of really bursting on the scene at a time when the scene was beginning to fall apart, when it was beginning to become more and more difficult, you know? Perhaps if Romanian cinema had broken, quote unquote, in the early 90s, it would have been a much bigger presence on art house screens. I mean, look at Iranian cinema. You know, at one point, I remember in 1997, there were five Iranian films playing in New York City. Hmm. Almost unbelievable. But by then, Iranian cinema was understood, appreciated, and different cinema showed it. Now, one could say, well, that didn't continue, but still, it made a real mark on the kind of art house going public right so 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 this is again a, a, a sense of getting people because it's like an acquired taste to show yeah. to the to, to 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 the public uh, precisely because the american public is is uh, exposed to so much film and so much online ex- experience in terms of audiovisual uh, this kind of constancy helps the, the American public and also being in New York, it helps the American public to get accustomed to a certain num- number of things. Also because we were covered by the press and this is, this is also great. Now for this edition, the 15th edition of Making Waves, you have seen a number of, uh, of films and I have to say it's a moment when I have to say that again we are so grateful to Jacob Burns Film Center, to Brian Ackerman and Andrew Jupin and all the team there because they created this platform and we are their uh, first season that is uh, streamed the platform completely which, uh, which is an experience both for them and for us uh, and, and because you saw some of the films uh, in this season, what what uh, what did really impact you? What how do you comment? We do have your comments online also. But what were the films that really? What what's your reaction to the films that you see that you saw from the programming? Well, I, I guess what I always like is I see you know uh, Romanian cinema continuing to offer challenging works. You know, again, I I don't see all Romanian films. I wish I could see more. But the ones that I saw really led me to believe that people are still making very challenging works. Uh, You and I spoke earlier about my great admiration for Ivana the Terrible. I mean, I think it's just a wonderful film and very creative. And again, just shows Romanian cinema moving in a slightly different direction, but having many of the qualities of what I appreciate about earlier films. Uh, Again, a very, at times, very uh, uncomfortable viewing experience, but I think a very, very interesting one. On the other hand, it's nice to see films, for example, such as Legacy, and to see that, you know, here's a very well done thriller, kind of one that, you know, is it one of those films that really deepened the more you watch it? First, you said, okay, mystery about this guy, what happened to him, but then it reveals so much more, you know, uh, the mystery almost becomes secondary or tertiary to what you're really getting out of the film. So, you know, not only is Romanian cinema continuing to explore those factors that I think brought it to the world's attention in the, you know, 2000s, but, you know, it's continued to sort of also try new things out and being successful at them too. I was also very glad that you continue to include documentaries because, you know, too often, you know, we don't really include in these national film series looks at documentary. And of course, that remains in many places a really vital field. And uh, there's a great history of documentary filmmaking in Romania. So, for example, House of Dolls, which, you know, I think is a really wonderful film. And I have to say, a film that stayed with me since I've seen it. A uh, film I keep thinking about, you know, and just again, one of those films that I think is very subtle because it's a good example of a filmmaker, to my mind, just making the right choices. You're just figuring out, this is where I'm gonna put the camera, this is when I'm gonna be part of it, this is when I'm gonna record a monologue. Again, it was one of those films that, while very casual, is very cleverly constructed. And I enjoyed that aspect of it. 
and uh, and um, uh, Richard, as you as you know, we also have it's one of the first times that we be, we we did a, uh, also a series of shorts, and mm -hmm. some of the shorts are created by young directors and by directors yeah. who are debuting, and this uh, allowed us, uh, like uh, Mihai Kirilov said, all of them were awarded at TIFF. So I encourage everyone, Andrew Jupin just told me that the series in the shorts is very much regarded, is very much viewed by the people who bought the passes. So uh, I encourage everyone to see them because future directors are there to be, uh, yeah, no, to be looked always, at. That's always the best news that, you know, again, and I think we already see it, that, you know, that first generation that appeared to us in the 2000s, there are already younger generations and even younger generations so that we see Romanian cinema is going to keep going. Uh, again, that became in various ways, I think, one of the things about Iranian cinema that sadly, partly because of political conditions and whatever, there wasn't really a second generation that came up after that first great explosion. A few names, but not as powerful perhaps as that first. So perhaps interest in that cinema waned because it just didn't you know, continue. But I think in Romania, we're seeing more and more new talents emerging. Emerging. Now, to come back also to the documentary part, because you spoke about Tudor Platon's uh, um, uh, film, The House of Dolls, and you spoke about Dorian Boguta's film, Legacy, and about Ivana Mladenovic's film, um, Ivana the Terrible. Uh, to documentaries, we opened Making Waves with the um, collective, the film by Alexander Nanao, which is really a an immense success internationally and great, also yeah. a unique uh, si that we are now in this situation where the film is both on the um, uh, long short list of the yeah. international selection and on the short list of the documentary and we are really looking forward now in March to see what's what's happening and also the film Akasa Home by Radu Chornichuk. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, a very interesting subject and a way of, of, of doing things. Now, do, do you think that also generally uh, it, it's a moment when documentary um, won some territory uh, generally internationally in, in, uh, in the film industry? And if it's so, it, if it is so, why? Um, yeah, there's almost no question about it. I mean, if I can give you the US example, in many ways, uh, although you know he's always somebody who people love to both praise and blame, I think Michael Moore opened up a new category. I mean, you know, when Roger and Me came out in 1989 and you know made eight or nine million dollars at the box office, that sounds like nothing today. At the time, it was unbelievable. I mean, documentaries, unless they were about rock and roll or <laughs> you know something like that, stars, made and they certainly were never released in movie theaters. And Michael really opened up a theatrical space for documentary. And of course, he went on to continue to have success. But it made just documentary, again, part of what was offered. And you know, there are several things. In the US, uh, I think you probably have it in Romania too, there was the emergence of what people call reality television. And I think that sort of um, uh, opened up people to be more, how could you say, willing to watch, quote unquote, real life stories. You know, and that sort of, so I think as time's gone on, documentary has just become a much more accepted genre. It's not something, you know, documentary when I was growing up was something you had to sit through in school, you know. Now we're going to tell you about the partition of Poland, uh, you know, you sort of watch something on screen, yeah. like moving maps or something like that. Now it's not. Now it's become a very vital form of filmmaking. It's interesting to think the cultural factors that made this possible. One might be what I mentioned before, the fact that moving images are just so much part of our world now. I mean, you just see them all the time. Uh, we all have uh, cameras on our telephones. So people are constantly making films of themselves or their loved ones or their neighborhoods or something like that. So because of that, I think it's just uh, precipitated a greater acceptance of documentary as a film format. And you know, certainly Romanians have got, you know, continued to make very interesting films. Uh, uh, thinking also, you know, when I was preparing for this, about that great documentary we showed a few years ago about Ceausescu that was in the New York Film Festival. Uh, yeah. By Ujica, uh, by Ujica, the Ujica. autobiography of, of Nicolae Ceausescu, which is amazing. And, and, and well, 
it's 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 an amazing film that we presented at the 30 years in, in 30 films uh, at film forum and uh, and indeed it's one of the films that the, the more you look at it with distance the more shocked you are but by, by its uh, uh, its uh, its reality because it it really it's it's a lesson in power and a lesson yeah. in history and it, it becomes each year more relevant in a uh, in a way uh, the the Andrei Ujica film. Now um, we we were, you you loved very much Ivana's uh, film mm -hmm. uh, Richard and I, I have a question regarding women directors because you yes. know that we had Adi, Adina Pintilie's uh, yes. Touch Me Not we have uh, the Ivana we have Mona Nicuara we have a very, very well-known um, uh, author of uh, animation and of animated film, Anka Damian. What, yes. what, what about the, uh, the, what about the generation of women? I mean, not generation, but the women uh, filmmakers. What, what's, what's the situation now? Because I know that this uh, um, encouraging, uh, encouraging women uh, uh, authors is also a tendency right now in the industry. How, how does it look from your perspective? Well, in a way, again, if you look at, we spoke about East European cinema generally, East European cinema in many ways has been more hospitable even during the communist era you know, to women directors. I mean, you can think of uh, Agnieszka Holland in Poland or um, you know, Verta Kitilova, Czechoslovakia, or, you know, so many, Marta Mejeros in Hungary. There were always, I mean, again, overwhelmingly male industries, but there were always women who were part of those industries who were able to make films. And that was sort of true in Romania as well, as Elizabeth Bostan and other directors who had been working, you know, and teaching for years. Uh, my sense is, and again, I say this out, out of ignorance, there's not really a kind of what could you say, separate women's cinema, separate from the overall yeah. scene. I think there are a lot of other, a lot of women who are working and they're working well. Um, I love Kulich, you know, a film that, you know, you referred to. Yeah, yeah. Incredible film, very, very creative film. And, and again, I think the work by a number of different women directors, you know, has been seen internationally, whatever. Probably the accent has been, for various reasons, on the work by male directors. But I think there's been a steady stream of films by women that have been part of this overall Romanian movement. Richard, I'm I'm, I'm going to to, to to we we are we are going towards the end of our uh, of our conversation, unfortunately. But I'm 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 very curious. What do you think about the present evolution of the industry? I know that you are not no more because you're no longer at the right. Film Society of Lincoln Center, so you are less close. But you have a distance, and you can look at what's happening, and you are very much also still into it. Uh, uh, pandemia, the pandemic situation brought about this uh, this uh, uh, closing of cinema, art cinema uh, venues, and a lot is happening online. And Netflix, as you say, is very kind of non not curated, and other platforms are not curated. So, how do you see for the directors who are now doing films uh, this new? situation, the mutation, the, the transformation of the industry. And what do you think a, a, a director should expect from the, from the venue that is taken now? Right. Uh, again, a sort of interesting and, and large question. In a way, I think what the pandemic has done is really intensify trends that were happening already. Let me go back to when I was at Lincoln Center, which is already, what, eight years ago, almost nine years ago. You know, even then, I was proposing or interested in exploring, once we started the uh, Eleanor Buna Monroe Film Center, I thought the next project for the Film Center, Film Society, and I knew I wouldn't be part of it because I would be leaving, would be to have some kind of platform or channel. You know, I thought, look, we're putting on, you know, Open Roads, New Italian Cinema, obviously it's fills up, you know, wonderfully popular series. What about people who live outside of New York who aren't really going to drive in, or maybe they'll drive in one day, but couldn't drive in more than that. I said, why not put those films somewhere where maybe two weeks later, people could, you know, begin to see those films for some very limited run. And, you know, people were interested in that. 
uh, you know, for various reasons, that project never got fulfilled. But it seemed to me that was the future. Now, that was still a future that saw the primacy of theatrical presentation. If anything, I think the pandemic has really focused the fact that platform presentation of films is here to stay. I mean, I can't imagine the New York Film Festival or other festivals that were forced last year to put their films on platforms so people could see it. We'll do away with that. They simply won't, you know. Uh, people, you know, they told me that people from all 50 states attended the New York Film Festival, that is going online and seeing the films. I can't imagine they'll give that up. And how that affects their overall programming policy and strategy They'll have to decide, but it's here to stay. It's not leaving. It'll be here, I think, you know, forever. Uh, beyond that, how it'll affect filmmakers. Well, what will it mean to filmmakers if they know that their works are going to be primarily seen, you know, digitally, you know, seen on, you know, platforms and things like that? Well, that's been true somewhat for a while, especially in Europe where, you know, films were really shown more on television than they were in movie theaters, the whole new German cinema, for example, back in the 70s, was financed by German television, you know, and those films eventually were shown on TV and shown to much bigger audiences than they, you know, received when they were in movie theaters. You know, some people will say that this will lead or already has to more serial work, you know, that people will say, hey, I don't have to make a 90 minute film, I can make a five hour film. I'll just cut it into five pieces or three pieces or now however many pieces and be able to develop stories and characters and, and different things like that. Or I might be able to tell more than one story at the same time. I mean, there's what I tell my students or I call what I'm teaching, the televisual narratives. If you watch many TV shows, you have five or six stories going on at the same time and the film goes back and forth. And you can see that already in a number of films that have taken on that kind of uh, story, that story structure in a way. Whether or not you want to specifically say it's televisual, you can think of earlier film examples, but certainly television popularized that. So I think there are going to be ways in which television will, or, or the fact that films will be yeah. seen primarily on platforms through digital means, will affect, I think, certain kinds of storytelling structures. You know, in the end, some people tell you, oh, it just depends on if you have a good story and it's well told and whatever. Yes, but I think how that is told will really change over the years. How, I don't know. Um, now, I think that we'll never get rid of theatrical presentation. And I think the studios are trying to figure out how they can very quickly create some kind of new virtual reality cinema. You know, a cinema in which you know, basically you're seeing three dimensional figures. Uh, as someone once told me in Hollywood, somebody who works in Hollywood told me, in the future, when you go to see the Avengers, they won't be fighting in front of you, they'll be fighting next to you. You know, you're really gonna be in an immersive environment where all of the, now I, I think that will be interesting and exciting, I hope, but I also think it'll be difficult and expensive. So I think there'll be very few of these places and that will make it, those experiences probably limited mainly to big cities and places like that, which can afford a, or can have the possibility of a steady clientele. But I, I think in time, the vast majority of work will really be destined for platforms. You know, you, know, you can see it now. I mean, films like, say, the most recent Spike Lee film or Nomad Land or these other films, they're primarily going to be seen on platforms. They're not going to be seen in movie theaters. Even I, and I think this won't necessarily change so much once we can go back to movie theaters. That's my somewhat right, uh, but, you know, yeah. not, but, hopeful, not hopeful prognosis, but, you know, I but, think people... But, 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 but realistic one. Well, you know, but I also have to say, I mean, I can look in my own family, you know, I have children. You know, if you're going to ever have a home in which children were oriented to watching movies, it should be mine. But especially, I'd say, my two daughters who are, you know, I have a son who is, I think is fairly film oriented. But my two daughters, they watch a lot of movies, not really go to movie theaters. You know, they really watch them online. And they watch even older films online. But they don't really, the idea of going to a movie theater is not a reflex for them. Them. What can I say? You know, this is, yeah, I think, yeah, how yeah. people but, but, are but, 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 but Richard, just, just to make this point for you, who saw a lot of films on streaming, on the laptop, on, uh, on, what do you prefer? I mean, very honestly. Oh, there's no question. I mean, 
to me, I mean, if you look in the last 20 years, two of the things that define cinema in a way that I have been lost or been seriously challenged, one was the use of celluloid and one was the idea of group projection, you know? I was never and I'm not a celluloid purist. You know, there are people who say, oh, you know, I won't see that film. It's, a, you know, it's digital. Or what, you know, I think there are now really incredibly good digital copies. They're just getting better, you know? So, I mean, yes, you know, if I see uh, IB tech print of Vertigo, it'll probably be better yeah. than a 4K restoration of Vertigo, but maybe not in five years, you know? I mean, in a way, all those technologies keep getting better where film technology is frozen. You know, it's not getting better. No one's working on it. But I don't mind that as much as I mind the end of projection. Um, it's sad to me that we're not congregating as groups and watching film. Uh, I always say there's a reason that we cite the Lumiere brothers as the inventors of cinema and not Edison. Edison created a, a single person device, the kinetoscope. Whereas the Lumieres created the cinematograph, which projected images. Once we lose that, I think we lose something very essential about cinema. But, you know, that's, again, my nostalgic feeling. And as I said, certainly younger generations feel much less loyal to the idea of uh, group projection than they do just watching images. Yeah, we, we lose something essential in terms of shared artistic experience and uh, well, and we lose something essential in terms of uh, art, arts. I mean, that's that's I that's so, the thing you know. because it, it it's just art is not not just about an a, a, an object, a product product. It's it's about this sharing and common commonality and and sharing commonality. Now, my last question. I know it's a risky one, Richard. Uh, um, is uh, do you have favorite scenes in Romanian films? Do you have favorite? Wait, wait, I'm sorry. What? Favorite scenes, a scene which is your favorite uh, in in a Romanian film. Do you have uh, or, or just uh, well, just tell 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 me the first uh, well, the first idea that you have now, the first uh, glimpse of a Romanian film that comes to your mind. Yeah, um, you know, I, I, I mentioned uh, four three two before. There are so many incredible moments in that. You know. Uh, the moment with Mr. Baby, you know, when he goes into the bathroom, you know, and the two women are waiting there trying to figure out what's going on. I mean, that is, you know, just one of the great horror film moments. Uh, or the terrible moment when she disposes of the baby. You know, that's another one. Uh, Lazarescu has so many incredible moments. I mean, you know, when he's on the table and almost falls off and different things like that. Uh, you know, going back, you know, obviously, again, there are sort of, uh, I always think of the long ending of the Mirsha Danielio film, Jacob, you know, yeah. when he's in the oil bucket, he's trying to figure out how to get out. I mean, that's another yeah. amazing, 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 amazing. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, again, it's, or I, I love the film, which we didn't speak about, uh, called The Great Communist Bank Robbery, you know, about, you know, one of the few, if not the only bank robbery during the communist era in the Eastern Bloc, when after it's all done, they all get together and also look at each other like, why did we do this? You know, I mean, it's sort of like, because the whole thing, I mean, it seems like a symbolic, weird gesture in a way that they're doing. I mean, there are a lot of I like that film very much, but among the things I like about it is that moment when it's over and they're all sort of like, why do we do this? You know, there's a kind of strange, you know, um, how could you say, uh, openness about, you know, we did this and not really, really sure. We don't know what we got out of it, you know? I mean, it was a kind of gesture of, you know, uh, you know, defiance and, you know, whatever, but not really one that was going to be productive in any way. Yeah. Well, it's a very, it's a in a way, it's a very schizophrenic image. <laughs> yeah. That one, that last one, and yeah, and, no, because um, I mean, again, it's clearly there's a, an element of resistance, of defiance, but for what reason? You know, it just it's, seems like an empty it's, gesture. It's an absurd. It's it's a, a, a it's touch of absurd in it, like in yeah. all it's Romanian. Chapter, you know, and I think people, of course, use that phrase almost too much with things from Eastern Europe. But that really is a moment that captures something very Kafka esque. You know, this idea that, you know, a system, you know, that exists for no reason other than to be absurd, you know. 
Good. Richard, thank you so much for this My pleasure. Uh, Always a pleasure to for talk this to passionate you. and uh, as <laughs> always as always intense discussion and uh, we look forward to to meeting you again and as you promised seeing your library directly in new york we don't Next know when this will happen uh, i will give you a tour <laughs> but uh, but at least we had a virtual a virtual, virtual glimpse, okay. glimpse of it <laughs> thank you so much okay, thank great. you so great much until very thank soon you. That's the block of the show. okay bye, bye now.